Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you that we could all be here. Thank you that we have your word and that we can learn from your word. And I ask that you would uh, reveal yourself to us through it today, that you would speak to us, Lord, and that we would grow closer to you through it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, welcome. For those who were here last week, we got to the end of Ruth. Finally. So, it took us 10 weeks to get through the four chapters of Ruth. Is that what you were expecting? No. 10 weeks. Yeah, I didn't either. But there was a lot there, right? It's pretty amazing. So... To begin with, I just thought I'd ask, like, what are some of the things that stood out to you over the last month, two and a half months that we've been going through the book of Ruth that you remember? Goel, well, the idea of the Goel. I remember, like, the words in the other language, but Goel is like, what do you remember about it? I mean, you did go on about it for an hour, so. <laughs> it is true. When she, when she lay under the feet, All right, and, yes. then, and then she was, like, touching her feet. What was what was the what was the point? What was she doing there? How how did she ask him? But your brother questioning him with the with the status symbol on his the Yeah, so she asked her to, she she asked him to extend his, the hem of his garment, right? His kanaf over her, and we said the hem of the garment was a symbol of that person's authority, and so she was asking to be brought under Boaz's authority. And essentially, she was asking him to protect her, to provide for her, which is marry her. What do you remember about the Goel? Um, that needed to be marked. And then there was Goel mentioned a lot of times throughout the Bible, but it's like, I can't remember. It meant another thing. It meant another thing. Uh huh. Yeah, it was the it was this word goel means redeem, but it it had it was applied in two different ways. One was to redeem to pay the debts of somebody so that they can go free. The other was to avenge. Yeah, it's, it's coming for the avenging. Yeah. What else? Yes. Nate actually sent me a Instagram video where somebody had actually done something along that line. So it's quite funny. What else do you guys remember? Sorry? The dude with no name. Shh. Which, which dude with no name? The closer relative. What's his name? What's his face? What do you remember about him? He was a close relative. And? Uh, he had the first choice. And he did want it until he realized the cost that came with it. Which was he had to look after. Your mom. <laughs> yes, exactly. Your mom. Your mom. <laughs> Technically. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. What else? Listen. Did we talk about that? Oh yeah. Is that what you mean? But yes, it family tree, right? What did what do you remember about that? Lots of great grandkids. Certainly, Ruth and Boaz form quite an important part of the. Not Jesus, Solomon. Jesus was well down the line, but yes. Um, 
Shh, guys, listen. Uh huh. What was the relevance? What was that called? Do you remember? Threshing? Threshing, threshing was where you bashed up all the wheat, right? So you separated all the chaff, the husk, from the grains. That was the threshing. And, then what was and that was done on the threshing floor, right? Which they swept. Then what happened? And then throw it in the air. What was that called? I don't know. It was called throwing it in the air. Winnowing. That was winnowing. The big winnowing fork throws it in the air. And then what happens? It's a big, it's a big like pitchfork. So it separates, right? The chaff lands in a big pile far away, gets blown away by the wind, and it gets what happens to it? Wait, shh. What happens to that? It blows away and goes into a separate pile. And what do they do with it? Burn it. And then what happens to the grain? They keep it. They sleep with it. They sleep with it. It lands nearby, right? It lands nearby the person doing the winnowing. And it gets kept, it gets put in the barn and sold and etc. What was the relevance of that? Do you remember? Separating separating the good from the bad people. So John, I think it is, says one's coming after me. This is when he's baptizing, I'm pretty sure this is right. The one coming after me who's Shoes I'm not willing, uh, not not worthy to untie, right? And he says, and the winnowing fork is in his hand, and he is going to separate the wheat from the chaff, right? He's going to separate those who are grain that are solid and that stay close by him from those who are not. And they get blown off, and, and yeah. Anyway. So it's like a picture of our lives, basically. Our lives here, we're on the threshing floor, we're getting beaten and stuff, because that's kind of what a lot of life is like, and thrown up in the air, and the question is, where are you going to land? Are you going to stick by God? Are you going to stay faithful to Him, trust Him, or are you going to get blown away? What else? Who remembers... uh, so, start of chapter 2, Ruth and Naomi are back in Bethlehem and they need food. So, what, is, what do they do? The, uh, they scavenge. I don't know what it's called. He goes weeping. Gleaning. Yes. What was the... The, uh, the people who own the farms and stuff had to leave things for the people, for the people who were homeless and can't provide for themselves for their big gleaning. Correct. Stuff. So what was the lesson? What was the significance of that? That the that you're being kind. <laughs> so that was one, right? Be generous, provide for the poor, which is something that comes up again and again and again in the Bible. What else was the significance? What did it require on the heart of the farmer to leave parts of his field unharvested? He had to be generous, but what did it require in order for him to be generous? What did it require? Yeah, pretty close. I would use a slightly different word. It's what faith actually means when you, well, what I think faith actually means. It's what belief, yeah, I think it's about trust. I think when we talk about having faith in God and believing in God, it's not about believing that God is real. It's about trusting Him. And the whole point of that, those laws, the Sabbath law, the gleaning laws, the tithing laws, it requires you to trust God, to trust that He will provide for you even though you're not harvesting all of your field, even though you're obeying Him. Yeah? Okay. What else? So Ruth goes and lies down at Boaz's feet, asks him to marry her. He says, 
He says, I love to, but there's another, right? And so then we talked about like, well, what did we talk about there? Like another person. A closer relative. That, that has the inheritance. That has the right. That has the right. Of but what, what lesson did we draw from that? Oh, yeah, you have to well, trust God again. Because he had to trust that it, even when you obey God, that it will still work out. Yeah, so he's faced with the situation. He wants Ruth, Ruth wants him. But there's a, something in the way that, and that something is obeying God, right? So what do you do? Do you take things into your own hand, try to make it work, even though you're kind of not obeying God? Or do you trust him that if you do things the way he wants you to do them, he will bring about the outcome that is best in your life? And I recommend that one. Because we talked about the difference. If you try to do things in your own hands, what does that come with? You're in control. It's, it's your problem, right? So what do you do? Worry about it. Because it's your problem. But if you put it in God's hands and you trust Him that He's going to bring about the outcome that's right for you, what does that produce? Peace. It's not worry, right? Because it's not in your hands, it's in God's hands, so you can actually have peace in your life, which is what God wants for us. So there's lots of awesome stuff in there, right? There were also some like quite cool discoveries, like this, yeah, the middle thing, the word goel, used 21 times in the book of Ruth, 104 times in the whole Old Testament, and the middle one is Ruth verse 4 verse Ruth 4, verse 4, when, go out, when Boaz confronts the other redeemer and says, what are you going to do? Five times. More times than any other verse in the Bible. And it's also the same verse that the middle Goel in the book of Ruth is and that the middle Goel in the whole Old Testament is. It's all the whole concept of redemption is centered on that verse. When Boaz confronts the other redeemer and we're going, it's like the climax and we're going to find out who's going to win. Who's going to get Ruth? Who's going to be the redeemer? All right? Pretty cool. And then last week we looked at some other quite like cool discoveries. Do you remember anybody was here? You weren't here. It was quite cool. After, after Boaz says, so now he's won, he's going to marry Ruth, and the people in the village say, may your house be like the house of? Perez, not Perez. Who was Perez? Sorry? That's what the thing says. May your house be like the house of Perez who came up bought to Judah because of the offspring which the Lord gave. Yeah. So Perez was the offspring that she he was the son of Tamar and Judah. And if to find out about Tamar and Judah, we had to go where? Genesis chapter 38. And then you have this really yucky story about how Perez came about. But then there's like a really amazing discovery there, which was? No, no, no. In the text. In the text. Remember? We looked and found that in the text of Genesis 38, where it tells us where Perez comes from, is the genealogy of David. Boaz, Ruth, Obed, Jesse, David. In code. No? You don't remember that? You weren't here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every 48 letters, start with the first B, count 49 letters, you come to the O, count 49 letters, you come to the Z. We did it in the Cultivate as well, yeah. And so it was this amazing example of where God's actually authenticating His word. He's saying, This is mine, because nobody else could have put that there. It's really cool. So anyway, there's been lots of, I think, great stuff in the book of Ruth. I really enjoyed it. It was a lot more than I expected. But, pretty much, 
I mean, I had listened to studies on it before, but I'd never done a study on it myself. And putting it all together was quite exciting. And like I said, there was a lot more in there than I was expecting and some cool lessons and things. But if you remember when, I, when we started the book of Ruth, I said that there was another reason why we were going to be studying it. Does anybody remember what that was? A long time ago now. I said it had a nice story, but that wasn't the reason we were going to study it. There was another reason. <laughs> it's going to, because we're going to Romans next. It sort of does, but that wasn't the reason. Prophecy. I suggested that the book of Ruth, the story of Ruth is a dramatic, as in drama, acting out, an acted out prophecy of... Yeah. So, I've, there have been little hints along the way, but that's what I want to do today, is look at how this story that we've just gone through and learned all these lessons from how it is also a prophecy of the gospel, basically. But I'm hoping you guys can come up with some suggestions. So, in what ways can you think of that stuff in the book of Ruth has some kind of like larger significance to the story of history, basically? So that's a pretty clear one, right? We have who is the Redeemer? Boaz. We have Boaz and he is a Goel, which is a Redeemer. And we looked at what the Redeemer did, which was? The one thing that he does is redeem things. And the other thing he does is avenge things. Now... What was required in order to be a redeemer? What were the requirements? Sorry? You had to be related to the person you were going to be redeeming, right? You had to be a relative and a reasonably close relative. Good. What else? What do you have to do? Is what in every scenario? Like the, he had to marry Ruth to be the redeemer. Do you have to, is that from No. No, that's one of the responsibilities of redeemer. So you have to be a kinsman, you have to be a close relative. You have to be willing, right? It's not compulsory. It's a disgrace if you don't, but it is you have to be willing because that other guy wasn't willing, right? The other the other redeemer. And then what do you think the third would be? I don't know if this counts as a requirement, but then like your son had to if you had a son or something and you had to like be able to be the head of Yeah. That's what you would do if you are a, a redeemer. But in order to act as a redeemer, in order to be the Goel. You have, to be able, you have to be able to redeem, right? You have to buy back all the land that belongs, belongs to that family. So you have to be able to do that. You need to actually, or if the person is a slave, has got themselves into debt and have basically been forced to go into like, to work for the person as a slave in order to pay back their debts and you want to redeem them, what do you need to do? You have to pay their debts, right? So whatever their debts are, you need to be able to pay that, right? So those are the three things. You need to be a relative. You need to be able to, to pay the debts that are required to do the redeeming. And you have to be willing. So Boaz was definitely all three. The other redeemer wasn't, right? He might have been able because it seems like he was able, but he wasn't willing. Boaz was able and he was willing 
and the third one was? Related. Related. Now, who does Boaz represent in this story? Jesus. Jesus. He's the Redeemer, right? So the question is, what have I got first? Was Jesus able to redeem us? Yes. What was required? Why? Well, if he's, if he's sin, he's, he's not a perfect sacrifice. And when we are considered sin, yeah, the Savior says he couldn't fulfill the law, so we admit that we did the law. Mm -hmm. Of course, we go on to be able to become perfect as Jesus was the only perfect lamb, so he can fulfill the law and can work for us as good. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the thing, right? Like, our debt is, like you say, it's to the law. We've sinned. And we now have a penalty to pay for that. If we pay it, no, I can't pay it on your behalf because if I pay it, I'm just paying it for myself, right? The only way for me, for somebody to pay on our behalf means they can't have that debt themselves. So they have to be sinless. And so is Jesus sinless? Well... God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. And as you know, that Jesus was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. And then in Acts 4.12, which is a really cool verse, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among people by which we must be saved. By his name, we must be saved, which means he's able to save us. He's able to redeem us. And there's no one else who can. So that's cool. So he fits that bill. He is able to redeem us. He can afford it. What was the next requirement? So... He had to be related to us. Is God related to us? Would, would, would God be a kinsman, a family member of ours in his natural state and in our natural state? Now the word became flesh, he was made human, and lived among us. We saw his glory, the glory of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then there's this really cool passage in Philippians that said, We should have the same attitude towards one another that Christ Jesus had, who though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, as something to be held on. It's saying, Jesus, who is God, right? He existed as God. But he didn't consider that something to cling to, to grasp onto. He was willing to let that go. Made himself nothing by taking on the form of a slave and being made human. In being made human, what did that do? What did he become to us? A kinsman. He became related to us. What does that mean? He's qualified to be one of our, our Goel, our Redeemer. And then that verse finishes well. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. As a result, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's a pretty cool verse. So, okay. He's able to save us. He can afford to pay our debt. He's qualified. He's a close relative. What was the third thing? He was willing. So is Jesus willing to save us? What made Boaz willing to save Ruth when the other kinsman wasn't? More than liked. I would say he loved her, right? That was the thing, like... 
this other, the other redeemer said he was happy to buy the land. But if he bought the land, he spent a whole bunch of money on the land, but then he had to produce a son through Ruth who would inherit it. So he would then lose it. So he would invest all of his children who he loved's inheritance in this land, which would then no longer belong to them. And he wasn't interested in doing that because he didn't, he had no affection for Ruth. She was nothing to him. But that wasn't true for Boaz, right? Boaz loved her. And so he was willing to redeem her. So, who does Boaz represent? Jesus. Does Jesus love those whom he's come to redeem? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him will not die but have eternal life. Just as the Father has loved me, Jesus says, I have also loved you. Galatians, so the life I now live in the body, I live because of the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And in Ephesians, live in love just as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us. And then we get these like really spectacular verses. I pray that you may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know that this love that surpasses knowledge and to know this love that surpasses knowledge beyond anything you can imagine or understand that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Something that's kind of just a fun little extra thing. How many dimensions are there there? So when you measure something, a box, That's how high, maybe how long, maybe how deep. Where's the fourth dimension? Who does physics? You do physics. How many dimensions are there? And? And? So we tend to think about three dimensions, but if you actually get into physics, you start talking, actually you start talking about a lot more dimensions, but you talk not just so space, there's three spatial dimensions. In space, you can walk around in three dimensions, but we talk about space time because time is a dimension. So we actually live in four dimensions, or at least we live in a world of four dimensions that we can actually access. So that's kind of funny. That he's got four dimensions in there. <laughs> anyway, just a distraction. And then in Romans, I love this verse. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Pretty cool verse. No, there are no verses, no dimensions here. Point is, do you get the idea? Do you think Jesus loves us? Jesus loves us. He's absolutely willing to be our Redeemer. So, uh, so, so the question was, yeah, I guess that goes back to the first one. God was always able to pay our sins, willing to pay our sins, but he wasn't our kinsman. So an angel couldn't pay our sins for us and God himself couldn't pay our sins for us. He's not related to us. It's not his debt. A really great prophet priest couldn't pay our debts for us because he is related to us, but he can't afford to, right? He can't afford to pay the debt. He's got his own debts to pay. 
So the only way for us to be saved was for God himself to add humanity to his deity, to become both God and man, so that he was both able to pay our sins because he was sinless, but also qualified to pay our sins because he was related to us. Does that make sense? It's quite cool. You get lots of that in there. And so then, and so that's what he did. And as a consequence, you can then say, it's the other cool verse. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where our death is your victory, where our death is your sting. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, that is Boaz in this story. What else did I want to say about him? Yeah. That's mostly what I wanted to say about him. Uh, I guess something else is... How was Ruth redeemed? What did she do? Mm -hmm. And then? Uh Uh-huh. Sorry. Exactly. She asked him, and then that was it. That was all she could do, right? From that point on, Boaz is in control. Who does Boaz represent? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, what can you do to add to your salvation? To do anything for your salvation? All you can do is ask him. What what was she asking him to do though? So it's not just asking her to pay his she's not just asking him to pay her debts and then she can go off and do what she wants. Right? She's actually committing herself to him committing her life to him, right? She's saying, my life now comes under your your authority, your protection, right? So it's quite a significant thing that she's asking and from her side, a significant commitment to him, right? So all she has to do is ask. There is a bit involved in that asking on her heart side where she has to actually decide that for the rest of her life, she is going to be long to Boaz. So it's the same with us, right? All we have to do is ask, but we are asking, in that asking, we are actually committing ourselves to God. We're committing our lives to Him. We're saying, my life is no longer my life, it's your life, right? But once you've done that, what else do you do? What else does Ruth do? Exactly. There's a verse... Uh, we keep, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author, the beginner, and the finisher of our faith. For the joy set out for him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken a seat, his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Because, as it says in Ephesians, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. Even your faith is a gift of God, and it's not by works. You can't do anything so that you can't boast about it because you didn't do anything. All you did was ask Jesus, give your life to him. Say, uh, say I, uh, yeah, I have no, I don't want to be in control of my own life, right? It's not going to lead anywhere good. I would rather my life was in your hands. Redeem me. And at that point, That's all we can do. The rest is Jesus, and we just wait. Trust. Then in Philippians, it says, I'm sure of this very thing, that the one who began a good work, who began your redemption, Boaz, where he meets her, where she meets him on the threshing floor, will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ, that he will ultimately complete the redemption. Does that make sense? And that's us. Cool. All right. So that's Boaz and a little bit of Ruth. 
Well, so who's Ruth? Us. Who's us? Every, uh, people. Which people? Gentiles and Jews, everyone, surely. Everybody in the whole world? Uh, everyone who asks. Hey, people who are willing to ask. Uh, who are those people? Who do we call them? Basically, the church, right? Ruth represents the church, who is described as the the bride of Christ. See if I've got verses for that. No, don't have verses for that. Or I've got them somewhere else. Yeah, so the church is described as the bride of Christ. We talked about that when we were in the book of Ephesians, and we're talking about husbands and wives love your church as love your wives as Christ loves the church. So Ruth represents us, and as we've said, like, what does she do? She comes before Boaz and asks him to redeem her and, to, and commits her life to him, basically, into his hands. Uh, okay, before we go through Ruth, what about Naomi? Who do you reckon Naomi represents? All the people? The Jews. the Jews. So it's quite interesting. Do you remember what the word Naomi meant? No, that was her sons. No, it was a good, it was a good meaning. Not groovy. It was a good meaning. It meant pleasant. It actually... Well, it actually means my... So the word comes from a word that means pleasant or delightful. And Naomi, that me, is, makes it mine. And so it's my delight, my pleasantness, the pleasant thing that I delight in. Does that make sense? Now, in the Bible it says, I thought to myself, this is God speaking, Oh, what a joy it would be for me to treat you like a son. What a joy it would be for me to give you a... Pleasant land, the most beautiful inheritance in all the world. What's it talking about? What's this pleasant land? Uh, the, the promised land. Israel. In Psalms it says, they, they despised the pleasant land, they did not believe His promise. What is that land? It's the promised land, Israel, right? So Naomi represents Israel. She rep represents the Jews, the Jewish people, God's chosen people. Yeah? What state is Naomi in in chapter 1? What's her situation? She's a widower. So she's in a foreign land as a widow, suffering. She's lost everything, right? And if you remember, she says... When she's speaking to Ruth and uh, Orpah, she says, My intense suffering is too much for you to bear, for the Lord is afflicting me. Call me Mara, because this is when she gets back to Bethlehem. Call me Mara, because the Sovereign One has treated me very harshly. I left here full, but the Lord has caused me to return empty-handed. Why do you call me Naomi, meaning pleasant, seeing that the Lord has opposed me and the Sovereign One has caused me to suffer? So how is she feeling? Specifically, though. Suffering, rejected, suffering and rejected by who? God. Yeah, that is exactly basically the sentiment of the Jewish people for most of the last 2,000 years. <laughs> after Jesus died, after Jesus died, the Roman Empire destroyed Jerusalem and, and the Jews were forced to scatter all over the world, right? And basically every single place they've gone, they've been persecuted more than more than any other people in history and more than we can imagine. The Romans persecuted them. The British Crusades, they were persecuted. The Spanish Inquisition, the German, German Holocaust, the Russian pogroms before the Holocaust, the Russian, the Soviet communists after the Holocaust. They're still being tracked down and killed today. Everywhere. And that's their sense. When I was in Russia, 
um, I was given this book to read, which recorded the history of the Jews in the area where I was staying. And there were things that were done to them that I wouldn't even want to talk about. But like, there was one village where in a day or two, 30,000 Jews were tortured and killed for no reason other than that they were Jewish. They were God's chosen people. Have any of you seen a movie called The Fiddler on the Roof? Really cool. Highly recommend it. It's an amazing story and, and it's quite funny in places, but it's also quite sad in places. And the, it's set in a little Russian village. So this is the, exactly the sort of situation that this book was recording all these examples of. Little Russian village, a small Jewish community away from the promised land and... The father, the main character, the father, Tevya, finds out that the Russians are planning a pogrom, which was basically they'd rampage through the village, burn the Jewish houses, destroy the Jewish businesses. And this just happened every 20, 30 years, 15 years, whatever. They would just decide it's time for another pogrom and they'd go and persecute the Jews there. And he, when he hears this, says to God, I know, I know, we're your chosen people but couldn't you choose somebody else once in a while? That was the heart. That was the feeling. They are in a foreign land. They feel abandoned by God and are suffering everywhere they went. That's Naomi, right? In chapter one, that's exactly the situation she's in. Why are they in that situation? Today. Today. Not why is not why was Naomi? Why are the Jewish people in that situation? They're the chosen people of God. Why are they? Why does it seem more like a curse than a blessing to be God, His chosen people? The, this is days before Jesus was crucified. It says, as Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city of Jerusalem, he wept over it. And said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come when your enemies will build walls around you, surround you and close you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you didn't recognize me. And then in Luke, he says, That's not Luke, sorry. That's the wrong reference. But he says, this is in the Old Testament. God says, I will scatter them to all the nations which they have not known. Now the earth was left desolate behind them and no one came or went because they had turned a pleasant land, Israel, into a desert. That's what the situation in Israel has been for most of the last 2,000 years. There was no state of Israel. There was no homeland for the Jews. But that's not the case anymore, right? God wasn't finished with Naomi. He still had a plan for her, right? And he's not finished for the Jewish people either. He has a plan for them. He says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will gather you from the nations and bring you back from the countries where you have been scattered. And I will give you back the land of Israel again. That's happened. In 1948, for... Like I said, almost 2,000 years, there was no land of Israel. The Jews had been scattered throughout the whole world. But that's starting to change now. He says, I will certainly regather my people from all the countries where I have exiled them in my anger and fury and great wrath. I will bring them back to this place and allow them to live here in the safety. They will be my people and I will be their God. And then in Jeremiah, it says, for I know the plans I have for you. You probably know this verse, but he's speaking to Israel plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future filled with hope. God wasn't finished with Naomi. He's not finished with Israel. What was his plan for Naomi? Who did it involve? It involved Jesus, Boaz. Who else? Who's Ruth? And? It's us. 
So God's not finished with Israel. He has a plan for them. Part of that plan involves us, his Gentile bride, the church. So while she's in Moab, she meets this person. What was her name? Ruth. What did her name mean? Friend or companion? Whose friend or companion was she? Ruth. Who's friend of that? Fa- yeah. Naomi. Today, the most consistent and reliable friend of Israel is the bride of Christ, the church. Ruth, Naomi. So Ruth gets back to back to Bethlehem. Who introduces her to Boaz? No. So that's so here's something that's so here's something really interesting. Does Naomi know who Boaz is? Yes. She does, right? Does she know him? No. No. Significance? Yes. Who does Naomi represent? She knows about her Redeemer, but she doesn't know her Redeemer. Who introduces Ruth to Boaz? It wasn't what's his face. It was one of the, one of the people working. One of the people working. Which one? It was oh, that one. Don't you know those names? It was his. You don't know his name. He was the chief servant. He was Boaz's chief servant, but you don't know his name. He's the one who introduces Ruth to Boaz. Now, if you remember, if you remember in our introduction, we talked about the story of Abraham and Isaac, right? Again, God basically tells Abraham to act out this prophecy. Go to a particular mountain, Golgotha, sacrifice your son whom you love there, your only son whom you love. And that whole story was prophetic of Jesus, right? So Isaac represented who? Jesus. Jesus. And then there was something really strange. When they come down the hill, we know that Isaac was with Abraham, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says... Abraham came down to his servants and they went home. And you don't hear about Isaac. He's gone. We don't hear about Isaac until... Not three, cha- not three days. You don't see him until somebody comes with his bride. Who came with his bride? It was Abraham's chief servant. Abraham sends his chief servant out to go get a bride for Isaac. Isaac represents Jesus. And you don't know his name. He's unnamed. We are told elsewhere what Abraham's servant's name is, and it is Eliezer. Do you know what the word Eliezer means? Eliezer means my, my God's helper. Or the help of my God. In John, Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. Whose helper? God's helper. The spirit of truth whom the world accepts because it does, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Because you know him. Because he lives in you and will be in you. And then in John 15, it says, when the helper comes, whom I will send on the Father's behalf, the Spirit of truth that comes from the Father, He will testify on my behalf. So who is the helper? Who introduces Ruth to Boaz? Who introduces us to Jesus? The Holy Spirit, the helper. Cool? Why is He unnamed? Why is He unnamed? Because the Holy Spirit because Jesus says, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of Himself. It's not about Him. He will speak about me. Jesus, the Holy Spirit's role is not to glorify Himself. It says this. He will, 
Uh, it doesn't say that there. Or it does in a different translation. I'm not sure. But he doesn't come to glorify himself. He comes to glorify Jesus. So it's not about him. He's a hidden ser- servant, right? Yeah. Unnamed. So he's the one who introduces Ruth to Boaz. Who introduces Naomi to Boaz? Ruth does. Quite cool, right? So then the one person left, which actually now is going to lead beautifully, is who's the other Goel? Kind of an important person in the story, right? Why? Exactly. You have something to add? Boaz did what the other near couldn't do. Quite right. So, so exactly as they've said, like the most immediate way of, for us to be saved, and if you think about Israel, they were given a means of salvation. It was the law, right? Obey the law, keep my law, and you will live. So that was the most direct means of salvation, the most direct mean of, means of redemption. Was it able to redeem them? No. It was not. So like he's the law. He represents the law. And what the law could not do, Boaz did, Jesus did. Make sense? Yeah. It's quite cool, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's all prophetic. <clears throat> all there hundreds of years before Jesus. Point being, God knew what he was doing. And he gives us hints of that all through his word, which is really cool. Now, from here, the plan was to go to the book of Romans. Because I think it's one of the most incredible pieces of writing pretty much on earth. I love it. We're going to see how it goes, but that's the plan. It's like 16 chapters, I think. We'll see. Hopefully, we'll be able to move a little bit quicker. But, but the book of Romans explains basically that, the difference between the law and Jesus as a means of salvation and does it in quite, exquisite, in quite an exquisite way, I think. And so, this actually leads quite well onto that. We're going to be digging way deep into that part of our of the story, I guess. Probably. Probably. It also has an amazing, uh, it has a whole section in there about the relationship between, G- between the church and Israel, which is the relationship between Ruth and Naomi, and what God's plans are there, and all sorts of stuff. So it's a pretty amazing book. Lots there. Uh, yeah. So that's that. End of Ruth. Next week, like I said, Joe is going to be coming and speaking. So you have a break from me for a week. And then in two weeks' time, we're going to start with Romans, which is exciting. Cool. All right, let's pray quickly. And then, like I said, I'm going to be going down and taking communion. And if anybody wants to come with, you're very welcome. Okay. Does anybody want to pray? Awesome. Amen. Thank you.